So today we're going to look at shock. So what is shock? Well, the dictionary defines shock as an acute medical condition associated with physiological symptoms such as a dropping blood pressure and a rising pulse and respirate. But what causes it? So there's only three things really. There'll either be an issue with the pump or your heart, there'll be an issue with the volume that's being pumped round, or there'll be an issue with where that volume is being distributed. And ultimately, all of these will lead to tissue hypoperfusion. So that's a lack of oxygen getting to the tissues. And if we can't oxygenate our tissues effectively, the cells cannot function appropriately. So in the initial stages of shock, we have a reduction in oxygen and that will lead to anaerobic metabolism. The cells are still trying to carry out their function, but they're doing it in the absence of oxygen. And that will lead ultimately to an increase in lactic acid. The body then tries to compensate. So the quickest way to get more oxygen in, of course, is to breathe quicker. So the respiration rate will increase. And then noradrenaline and adrenaline are released. And that serves two functions. One, it uh, increases the blood pressure because the blood vessels are vasoconstricted. So they are tightened up and that will concentrate blood flow to the heart and brain and secondly it increases the heart rate so it increases the cardiac contractility. One of the first organs to really suffer from tissue hyperperfusion is the kidneys so close observation of urine output is key in managing any um, form of shock. If we don't correct shock or, or jump in and try and um, solve the problem in this compensatory stage, we will very rapidly go on to the progressive stage. Um, and vaso, continued vasoconstriction will in fact um, compromise vital organs because it will continue to reduce the amount of oxygenation to those tissues. And we will reach a point quite quickly where that um, continued lack of oxygen will actually cause cell death and brain damage and death will occur in a few hours. So we've got different types of shock. The most common one we probably come across in maternity is hypovolemic and that's that lack of circulating volume. So this is a volume issue and this would be for things such as postpartum hemorrhage and antepartum hemorrhage. And then we have cardiogenic and neurogenic shock. And these are both pump issues, although neurogenic can be a distribution issue as well. And then anaphylactic and septic shock, which are both issues with distribution. So where that volume is being distributed. So looking at hypovolemic shock in a little bit more detail, this is a loss of circulating volume. Now, pregnant women, as you know, have got 50% increase in their circulating volume and they're usually fit and well, so they compensate extremely well for blood loss. And you may well have seen women who have lost a litre, a litre and a half, and actually be still relatively well. And symptoms often will, will not show until they've lost up to 15% of their circulating volume. <clears throat> so one of the first symptoms you will notice is their increasing respirate as the body is trying to compensate for that lack of oxygen. Heart rate will go up as our catecholamines, our adrenaline and our noradrenaline are released and vasoconstriction will make their skin feel quite cold and clammy. Blood pressure will drop, but only after about a third of the circulating volume has been lost. So that's really quite a late sign. And you'd be much wiser to concentrate more on the other signs and act on those before waiting for blood pressure to actually start dropping. And it is key that we look um, at their urine output. You may get a change to mental status because as there's a lack of oxygen going to the tissues, they may become a bit agitated, a bit confused, a little bit muddled. 
cardiogenic shock is a pump issue and hopefully you'll never see this in maternity um, because it normally follows a heart attack or a myocardial infarction and that's due to the left ventricle failing. You will see that it's characterised by a drop in blood pressure and a rise in pulse, but that pulse is quite weak when you palpate it. It's what we term weak and thready. They often feel cold and clammy and may well be cyanosed and confused. Pulmonary edema is extremely common with cardiogenic shock and the prognosis is very poor as 80% don't make it. And treatment for cardiogenic shock really hinges on supporting that cardiac function. So giving drugs that will increase cardiac contractility, such as adrenaline and reducing pain. So things like dimorphine. Neurogenic shock really is anything that will uh, disrupt the autonomic nervous system or the nervous system in general so spinal damage um, could cause it but in maternity we are looking at it from a uterine inversion perspective um, and what you get with neurogenic shock is a systemic loss of vascular resistance so that means that that sort of normal tone you would have in the blood vessels um, is gone and that's throughout the whole body so you get pooling of blood and you get hypotension because of that and disruption to the nervous system um, causes a bradycardia rather than a tachycardia so this is the only shock you will find that is the bradycardia and women often faint now with um, uterine inversion and again I hope you don't see this very often I've only seen it a few times in my career um, you will um, it's often associated with a lot of pain and can be exacerbated by um, postpartum hemorrhage, so hypovolemic shock as well. Treatment for neurogenic shock hinges on reversing the cause. So for us in maternity, the uterus is out. We need to get it back in quickly and get IV access and fluids and oxygen via the face mask. Anaphylactic shock is a distribution issue. So when I say distribution, it's the fluid within the blood vessels is seeping out into the interstitial spaces and causing edema. And it's usually due to a severe allergic reaction. So that edema can, if it's around the airways, obstruct those airways. We normally treat with adrenaline. Close observation is key and some IV fluids to try and increase that circulating volume. But we don't want to um, just pour fluids in either with anaphylactic or septic shock, um, as this is not going to um, completely resolve the issue. Um, and septic shock, um, similarly, but it's bacterial toxins that are causing the problem. These bacterial toxins um, cause damage to the blood vessels. And we will go into this in more detail when we look at septic shock um, um, and sepsis. And it causes restlessness, anxiety, the normal symptoms, tachycardia and hypertension. Pyrexia, they may or may not have a pyrexia. And treatment hinges um, on increasing that circulatory volume. But again, as I say, not just pouring fluids in for the sake of pouring fluids in, you will quickly lead to pulmonary edema if we do not um, carefully monitor that fluid input. So really a 500 mil challenge should be sufficient to um, get the blood pressure back up. And we need antibiotics in fairly rapidly and oxygen therapy. So we don't see septic, true septic shock very often in maternity anymore. Um, and that's mainly due to the introduction of the sepsis um, care bundles and the sepsis six and that golden hour to really get everything done. So you will see sepsis, but you won't necessarily see septic shock. And our treatment generically for shock, uh, irrespective of cause, we need to be looking at a top to toe approach and staying systematic. And, and if you say systematic and look from a top to toe perspective, you're never going to forget anything. So starting at the head, we need to support that respiratory function. So some facial oxygen in, in any emergency, we're looking at 10 to 15 litres high flow oxygen. We need to monitor vital signs and initially in emergencies, these will be quite frequent. So they might be every three to five minutes and then slowly becoming um, less frequent as the condition stabilizes. 
And you're looking to do temperature pulse, respiration, blood pressure, capillary refill, as this will give you an indication of your circulating volume, and also her consciousness level, so her AVPU or CAVPU as it's often referred to now. Then moving down, we need to get some venous access. So we need two wide bore cannulas. And in any emergency, we do need these wide bore cannulas. So that's the gray 16 gauge ones. A little pink or green cannula really isn't going to do it because we want to be able to get fluid in rapidly to these women. Um, so we've got our wide bore cannulas in and we need to take some blood out. And depending on the emergency, this will vary the bloods you require. But as a general rule, you'll be taking a full blood count and a group and save, plus or minus a cross match, some U's and E's and some LFTs. So that's urea and electrolytes and liver function tests. If you had something like sepsis you were dealing with or suspected sepsis, you might also have a lactic acid um, or a serum lactate rather and a... Um, blood cultures. So we've got bloods out, we need to think about putting some fluid in. And most commonly in emergencies, we um, put up a crystalloid. So a crystalloid such as saline or Hartman's. Um, and as midwives, we can under the midwives exemptions, put that first liter up as well without it being um, prescribed as such, but you do need to make sure you've got it prescribed afterwards. Um, and we can give up to three 3.5 litres of clear fluid before you really need to be considering blood. And that's because obviously clear fluid has no oxygen carrying capacity. Um, and so if we're just pumping clear fluid in, eventually she's going to run out of blood and uh, then she'll die. So really once you're putting your sort of third bag of fluid up, you need to be highlighting to your consultant colleagues that you're on the third bag should you get some blood. Colloid is the other fluid you may see used. You don't see it used as often as we used to. And colloids are things like gelifusin and Volplex, and these have larger molecules, so they tend to be less able to escape from the blood vessels, so help bring the blood pressure up more rapidly, but you don't see them used that often anymore. Moving down, we've got fluid going in, so we really monitor closely what's coming out. So a catheter with an hourly bag, and you're looking for 0.5 mil per kilo per hour. And this is quite important because we do all become quite complacent with the sort of 25 to 30 mils an hour being okay. But actually, if I have a lady whose BMI is 25, her urine output should be greatly different to somebody who's 45 kilos, uh, 45 BMI. So, you know, it is important that you calculate approximately how much you're expecting on an hourly rate based on the woman's BMI. Then if she's still pregnant, we may need to consider the four bests uh, around delivery of that baby. So when's the best time to deliver that baby in terms of gestation or day or night, because daytime we have more people around. Uh, where's the best place? So is she in an obstetric unit with NICU? facilities? Uh, when's the, what's the best team? So have we got all the right people um, that we need for the, to, to deal with this? And also what's the best route? So cesarean section or vaginal delivery. And there we have it, a brief overview of shock and some generic management. I hope you found this useful and I look forward to seeing you next time.